Good chance you've never thought much about brassica plants. Yet most likely you have eaten them, and someday you may even fuel your car with them. If you wander in the produce section of most any grocery store, you're almost sure to see brassicas. Cabbage, broccoli, turnips, cauliflower, bok choy, and kale are all brassicas you may have seen, tasted, or eaten in a favorite dish. Or maybe you sometimes cook with canola oil in your home. That's made from brassica seeds. Even McDonald's makes fries in an oil blend that includes canola oil. And if French fries cooked in oil made from brassica seeds is hard to imagine, maybe you can picture that mustard is made from the seeds of brassicas. Turns out, brassicas are an important crop around the world, and they have been for thousands of years. With all this diversity among brassicas, what exactly is it that makes a brassica a brassica? Good question. So the, the physical appearance of brassicas can be a little bit deceiving because humans have selected and bred them dramatically in ways that have changed them from their original appearance. So the real hallmarks of a brassica vegetable, if you look at the flowers, it will have four petals and they'll be arranged in a little cross. And the seed pod will look like a tiny, long, thin bean. It's called a silic. The leaves of the plant should be a little bit bitter and mustardy. Mustard seeds, mustard greens, Anything that has that little bitterness, uh, you might suspect is a brassica. Alex McKelvey studies the history and relatedness of plants as a botanist at the New York Botanical Gardens. His research about brassicas helps us understand the relationships among plants we depend on for food to live, their genetics, and how the environment, including humans, can influence them over time. I became interested in the history of brassicas initially through my work in Mexico. In Mexico, a lot of farmers eat wild edible plants that grow in their cornfields. One of those plants is field mustard or Brassica rapa. And I got to wondering how Brassica rapa got there and became culturally important for so many millions of people. We can learn a lot from the history of plants we eat, like brassicas. Understanding their history can help us prepare for growing the foods we need to live in the future. Because ancestral plants contain genetic diversity that can be valuable for modern plant breeding. As we selectively breed for brassicas that can survive the environmental changes brought about by climate change. So, what do we know about one of brassica's common ancestors? Turnips were kind of the first crop from brassica rapa, or field mustard. In Japan, we have mizuna, we have tatsoi, we have komatsuna. In China, we have bok choy and Chinese cabbage and wutai tsai. And then in the Mediterranean, we have broccoli rob and grelos. And all of that seems to have arisen from turnips in the Himalayas, which spread out east and west and were then selected for these different crops. So we like to call it the out of turnips hypothesis, kind of like the out of Africa hypothesis for humans. The diversity in Brassica arose initially in the wild with wild populations adapting to different conditions, spreading out hundreds of thousands of years of local adaptation. And then humans took it and ran with it. What we see around the world is that different populations of people live in sometimes very different environments. And these communities of people need food that will grow well in their particular environment and produce food to keep everyone fed. For example, Brassica carinata, also known as Ethiopian mustard, is a type of plant that is mostly found in Ethiopia. It is a tall, leafy plant. People in Ethiopia eat the leaves and use the seeds to make oil that can be used for cooking. Now look at how different this Brassica plant is. This type of Brassica is called Brussels sprouts, and they are a type of Brassica oleracea. Brussels sprouts were bred to have small heads all along the tall stem of the plant, instead of growing a single big head, like cabbage. So imagine how helpful it would be for people who have limited growing space to grow Brussels sprouts instead of big heads of cabbage. Cabbage, on the other hand, grows large heads of tightly wrapped leaves. Maybe you've tasted a salad made with crunchy cabbage leaves, like coleslaw. At the grocery store, both green and red cabbage are often sold. These are very similar, but they were bred to produce different color leaves. 
Why do you think humans chose to breed for two different color cabbages? But they're also a big part of cuisine, and people really like the taste of them. You can't really picture Korea without kimchi. They just become iconic and a piece of people's identity as well. Do you like kimchi? What about sauerkraut? Both of these foods are usually made with cabbage and other brassicas. They are fermented, so they have a distinct flavor and can stay fresh a long time, even without being refrigerated. However, carrying a large pot full of sauerkraut or kimchi could be tricky if you are a nomad moving from one place to another a lot. That's why we think that turnips, a brassica rapa, were developed by people living nomadic lifestyles. The modified root of a turnip is a good food source that can withstand being picked up and carried to the next place to live. In Turkish cooking, there are many traditional dishes that use turnips. These dishes include soups, stuffed foods, rolled foods, rice dishes, pastries, salads, and turnip juice. Cauliflower, another Brassica oleracea, was brought to India by the British Empire where Indian cooks created new dishes. One popular dish from northern India called Gobi Musalam is made with whole roasted cauliflower. What I observed interviewing people and looking into literature on the cultural information of this crop is that people really love this plant. How did people who lived so long ago figure out how to breed and produce new lines of brassicas? Thousands of years ago, people were not necessarily crossing plants using a Q-tip and touching a flower and then touching another flower. A lot of selection occurred in the field when people observed different plants that they particularly liked characteristics of. For example, fleshy roots or watery leaves or especially tender flower buds. Through selectively saving seeds from those individuals or weeding out undesirable individuals, people could select over time to create the crops that we know today. Brassica breeding isn't something that was done only in the past. For example, farmers are working with agricultural scientists to develop new lines for producing canola oil crops. Some canola oil is used for food, and some is being developed for use in biofuels that can power cars, trucks, and even airplanes. Another example of modern brassica breeding is the work that led to the brassica commonly known as Wisconsin fast plants which you may be growing for an investigation right now. Wisconsin fast plants are a rapid cycling brassica that flowers just 14 days after planting the seeds. Rapid cycling brassicas were envisioned and then bred for by Paul Williams, a scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who studies plant diseases. He developed rapid cycling brassicas as a tool for helping cabbage farmers throughout Wisconsin and in other parts of the world to grow healthy brassica crops. Paul Williams continues today, working with Dan Lawfer, also a plant breeder from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the Fast Plants team to continue refining and developing rapid cycling brassicas for use in research and education worldwide. Some of the same fast plants that were bred for cabbage research were later selectively bred to decrease their size so they could grow in small chambers in space. This allowed researchers to study how plants grow and develop without Earth's gravity. In fact, Wisconsin fast plants were the first flowering plants to successfully produce seeds in space. Still today, NASA scientists use lines of Wisconsin fast plants for research in space, testing how we might grow food on Mars someday. The diversity we see in modern brassicas is strong evidence that when a group of organisms are closely related, yet still have genetic diversity, they can change over time to look quite different and survive well in very different environments. And we see from other past agricultural challenges that populations with genetic diversity are more likely to survive disease outbreaks or significant environmental changes than when food crop populations are all very similar. In other words, diversity within a population can strengthen its resilience. This concept is similar to how having different types of people with different ways of thinking and different backgrounds work together. They can lead to new and better solutions to big changes. And that is exactly why it is important to have scientists and farmers from different cultures working together to solve the challenge of making sure everyone around the world has enough to eat. And we can continue to learn from brassicas, 
which played and continued to play an important role in feeding people around the world.